pray that God will help you because he will deliver. I don't, I never really thought about him helping me get divorced, but that's exactly what he did. In part two, Shari tells us how the Lord has blessed her and is thriving beyond anything she even dreamed of. Come along as we hear the rest of her story. Shari, one of the things you brought up that just is sticking in my mind is your use of the idea of God's deliverance and that God delivers sometimes through divorce. And I want you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, You know, I was always full of, I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, But God provided every step of the way. It was really miraculous. Um, For instance, one day, you know, I was at work and I was having a little internal pity party sitting at my desk and God just spoke into my spirit and he said very clearly, you know, I will be your husband. I will be your protector and I am going to provide for you. And I'm telling you from that day forward, he absolutely provided in miraculous ways. Um, My church gave me over $7,000 in rent payments, utility payments, Walmart gift cards to go buy food and gas. Um, They were there like a rock. Um, My brother bought me a house. I mean, it's his house, but I live there. He let me pick it out. I live there and pay taxes and insurance, and he doesn't ask for any profit off of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is what makes it possible for me because I'm on disability now. I injured my back really severely, and I'm actually on disability, so I don't have a lot of income. And, you know, God has just arranged things that make it possible for me to live on the small amount of money I get every month. So when I say deliverance, I mean it. He delivered, and he was with every step. So after a 40-year marriage with this level of, of violence and betrayal, What do you do with your anger? I was very good at sweeping it under the rug, you know, and just bottling it up um, because I was always worried about putting on the right front for everyone at church. Um, So I was pretty good at doing that. Um, So much so that I think when I finally did get into the counseling that led me to ask for a divorce, I had a very hard time even accepting that I was in an abusive marriage. I couldn't even say I am being abused. And it took many, many hours of counseling for me to finally be able to accept that at all and to be able to say it, even though to most people it would be as obvious as the nose on your face. But I still have a hard time, you know, wrapping my head around what I was, what the children and I were living in. What did your counselor say that helped you really see the abuse? I think he just over and over would tell me that it was, you know, that this is not how he should treat you. And just telling me over and over, you know, this is, this is abuse. I will also say the book by Lundy Bancroft, Why Does He Do That? Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men was very helpful to me. That was the main book, and that's the book I tell every everyone that I talk to who's going through those kind of problems to read that. Oh, at, you know, near the end, he gives a list of all the things that a man should be willing to do to change and what you should wait to happen, you know, wait for to happen before you agree to live with them. And it's a pretty sobering list. <laughs> talk to me about choosing a therapist, because you've been through a lot of therapists. You've been, you've seen a lot of counselors. Um, we did see many, many counselors throughout the marriage, and they were all Christian-based counselors. Now, some of them were perhaps a pastor at a church who really didn't have formal training. We did several of those. Um, we also went to a clinic that was a Christian clinic with some pretty famous names that probably most people would recognize if I put them out there. Um, we went to those clinics, and um, the funny thing was, through all of that, we would go in there and we would tell what was happening and what was going on. And it was pretty wild and crazy stuff. And they never said, this is abuse. It was always, you know, pray harder, you know, be better. God will heal. 
they never called it what it was. And that was one of the reasons I think that I stayed and stayed that contributed to it. Um, the counselor at the end, he was my Sunday school teacher, actually, at the church we were attending there. And he was uh, he had a master's degree in counseling. Um, and had, had actually been in practice at one point, but now he worked for the church. He was on their staff and, um, started out, you know, we were doing marriage counseling, but that just didn't help. And during the first six months when we were trying to save the marriage, he actually told me one day when my husband had done something atrocious, um, go home and run him a hot bath and wash his back for him. Like, put yourself in a servant role to him, you know, like show him the love of Christ. I did it, you know, and I remember he wrote me a little note when I came back to the next meeting. He had a little note sitting there in a book, a little gift with a bow around it. And the note was how proud he was of me for being willing to do that. And we had been telling him, this crazy stuff and abusive stuff that was going on. In fact, we had only had one meeting together with him because he said, nah, this isn't going to work. Y'all are too, you know, this is too much. So it's not like he didn't know what was going on, but yet that was his advice to me. So all of that to say, I now tell my friends and contacts that are having trouble like this, that I don't really recommend Christian counseling. And, you know, that may not sound like the thing to say, but, um, I would say unless they are trained in trauma and abuse, um, I wouldn't even consider it. I'm with you hundred percent. I'm completely with you. And he did at, after about six months, he did realize really what he was dealing with. And at, at a later date, he apologized several times to me for what had happened in those first six months. And he told me, he said, I, I have learned so much from you going through this and I will be able to put that into effect the next time I come in, you know, contact with this. But, um, he ended up being a great help. Um, he really went above and beyond the role of a counselor, um, and helped me have the courage to go forward. So this same counselor that counseled you so poorly at the beginning ended up having a humble heart saw the damage that was being done to you, realized that he was part of enabling it, and yes. turned around. This is a good story. I'm glad to hear it. Yes, and, and you know, he wasn't a deacon or an elder. And I went to a big church that had a lot of money. It's a wealthy church. But he had pull because he was on their staff, and he did all the running in between for me. I never had to go before the deacons, never any of that. He talked to them. And they ended up financially helping me so much. And they offered to discipline my husband. Once I had the PO on him, the protection order, they had armed security guards at the church. They had his picture. They made sure that he did not come near the church. They were so supportive. Wow. What a turnaround. I wish every church would be like that. When people don't feel anger, sometimes what they feel is despair or depression. How has depression played a role in your life? Oh, it's played a major role. I've been through at least four severe major depressions, which includes suicidal ideation. Um, Since I've actually gone through the divorce and come out of the other end, I I don't suffer from that now. I actually was in the day hospital at one point for a couple weeks, and then I actually had a hospitalization during the September separation um for about 10 days because i was suicidal i just was you know beaten down and crushed and it really took a toll in the end i ended up with severe major depression ptsd uh anxiety and panic attacks i would have panic attacks where i was paralyzed i couldn't even move Um, so it was it was pretty dicey there at the end are you seeing uh, a light at the end of the tunnel or some hope now that you've actually separated and divorced? Yes, I'm off of all of my medications. I did have a psychiatrist and um, he oversaw all of that. I am off of everything now. Um, I feel happy and content 
I don't suffer from the anxiety. I don't have to take the meds for that anymore. Um, so I feel like that is, you know, pretty much resolved. Now, I have been told that every time you suffer through a major depression, it makes it more likely you're going to have another one. Um, so, you know, I always have to probably be watchful for that. Yeah. Take preventative action. But I think my main problem was just living in that you know, situation with him, it was circumstantial. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a lot to be depressed about when he's not only violent, directly violent, but ignores you and, and treats you like you don't exist, or at least your feelings aren't important. It's damage being done on so many different fronts. So I always walked on eggshells. I expected the other shoe to fall every day. You know, what's going to happen today? I mean, that would be my first thought when I woke up. What today? Because there was always some nasty little surprise around the corner, you know, and that's a hard way to live your life. It's a lot of stress and anxiety. It gets- Let's go to another topic How about forgiveness. How do you work through that whole issue? I don't feel like I am unforgiving towards him. I've had people tell me, you know, that, well, it's time to forgive or you need to forgive. And I've always kind of felt like, well, I'll forgive when I am ready to forgive. You know, he's put me through a lot for a long time and I just might not be ready yet. (laughs) I'm not going to force that. Um, But at this point, I don't harbor hatred to him or anything like that. If I sit and dwell on some of the stuff that went on, I can, you know, get a little angry at him. But um, I mainly just look at it all as a tragedy and he's, you know, he's a very sad and tragic figure that has no contact with any of his family, any of his grandchildren, you know, and um, that's a very sad thing. So I have a lot of um, pity for him. Yeah. What do you do with negative emotions and negative self-talk nowadays? Because it's hard to get these guys out of our heads. They live rent free in our minds for a long time. So what does it take to get out those crushing messages that, you know, you really deserve this kind of treatment or that nothing, you don't deserve anything good or that nothing good will happen to you again? Well, I think of course, from a spiritual aspect to um, realize that you are God's beloved and that he loves you unconditionally. And I find reading the Psalms is very helpful with all of that to realize, you know, the kind of care and love that God has for us. Um, So that's the first thing I would say. Um, I also would recommend lots of counseling. You know, I mean, it's hard work. It is not something that you go do once or twice and everything's fine. It's long, hard work. And, you know, I didn't have the money to um, pay counseling and that was was a hard thing I but I was able to find counselors at one point I went through a, a woman's shelter and they provided free counseling for me and some free EMDR and then because I had the protection order and uh, I that made me uh, eligible to receive free help from the Um, county hospital system and they provided free emdr for over a year wow that's significant there and then of course through my church i happened to go to a large wealthy church that had a counselor more than one degreed counselor on staff and they gave it to me for free so i think many times there are resources and you just have to dig and find them And you have to be willing to put yourself out there to get the help. But I think it's really invaluable. And through all the hours of counseling that I've done, I've, um, you know, learned to accept that I'm a good person and I didn't deserve that. And God loves me. And um, I don't feel like my divorce Um, is a black mark on me. I look at my divorce as a deliverance from God, a literal deliverance. And there were many things throughout my leaving that were miraculous. The way that I received support from my church, my family, my friends, 
um, just, it was really an incredible journey. I'm with you a hundred percent. It was a life-saving divorce and it is God's will is to protect his beloved people. You know, the people created in his image. He doesn't want us to be beaten like that, tortured like that emotionally and, and, and uh, physically and so forth. I want to go back to one of the things you talked about a little bit, and that is that you were the one who got on the phone and you reached out and you tried to find sources of help. Because I think some people think that I'm helpless because they've bought into the lies, right? I'm helpless. I, I won't make it. What did you tell yourself to just pick up that phone and call the domestic violence shelter, call the church, call around and try to get uh, help and, and get some counseling? Well, I was in a really bad place mentally and emotionally, and I knew I needed help desperately. Tried to figure out, you know, got on the Internet, tried to find, you know, free resources. Um, and if you can, reach out to a domestic violence group if there's one anywhere around you. And there's probably even things online where you can talk to people online that would be helpful. Well, this is great advice because people need to realize that it's up to them. The help yeah. isn't going to come to you. You've got to pick up the phone. You've got to you've got to make it happen. When you've been in a 40-year marriage or almost 40-year marriage, we're going to call it 40 years. You deserve it. <laughs> 6 weeks. <laughs> 6 weeks. Yeah, that's nothing. Um, you've, you've been with this man or you were with this man for eight, since you were 18 years old. That means his wishes, his preferences, things that tick him off, things that he liked, those have been embedded in your mind since you were 18 years old and probably even before. How do you ever develop a separate identity how do you ever get his mind, his, I'm sorry, how do you get his voice out of your head? Well, it's not easy, and I don't know that I've totally done it. Um, there are still things that will trigger me, you know, and take me right back to instances with him, and all those emotions come flooding in. It gets better with time, um, and I hate to harp on it, but I'm going to tell you, counseling, counseling, counseling <laughs> um, is very... Uh, I feel like it's necessary if you really want to get healthy again, um, because, yeah, those those voices are in your head. Well, you're unreasonable. You're this, you're that, you know, and that's the way you start thinking of yourself. And, you know, when you're in a violent relationship, an abusive relationship with violence in it, um, a lot of times, you know, they'll lash out at you physically and you might lash back. And a lot of people want to make it sound like, you know, well, you are crazy, too. That's, you know, that's not true. You're, you know, defending yourself. And you just have to, I think, you know, therapy and books, reading books on the subject. If you can't get to therapy, definitely read books to help you understand that. No, that was somebody who was trying to survive. That doesn't mean I'm, you know, crazy. I'm psycho. I mean, I remember him sitting in court on one of our protection order hearings telling the judge I was psycho. And I was the kind of woman who would chase you down the street, which never, ever happened. Um, you know, and those things, they do stick. And you just have to get in the word and read what God says about you. Get with counselors if you can. Read books that tell you how those abusers work. and just. Keep putting that information in till you start to accept it. Right. I mean, you brought up so many important things. Reading books, there's so much online is so important. And then you mentioned earlier EMDR. Ten years ago, I'd never even heard of EMDR. Tell us a little bit about what it does for you. Well, the way I got into EMDR was the man at the church that counseled me. He was familiar with how that he had actually been involved in a program with it with veterans trying to deal with PTSD. And I had PTSD from all of this stuff. And so he's the one who recommended it. I found it helpful. I mean, it's a very it's a very strange thing to get used to. Um, and it involves eye movements and um, 
I know that the there was a road rage incident that I was in with my husband where he pulled a gun on someone who was driving next to us. And I was, of course, in between him with his loaded gun pointing across me to the driver that was trying to run us off the road. So um, I had, you know, some PTSD over that. And um, I remember we worked on that. That was the first incident. And it took about nine sessions to work all the way through it. But I can honestly say that doesn't, it's almost like it didn't even happen to me now. Wow. Um, And so we worked through a lot of things like that. Um, And after Genesis, I went to uh, the uh, victim intervention uh, program that they had um, in the city of Dallas. And they also gave me about a year's worth of free EMDR. Wow. A lot of people think of PTSD as being only for combat veterans. What were your symptoms? I would have bad dreams of incidents um, that had happened. Triggers. I could be watching something on television and some little something come on that would remind me of an incident that I had been in. And instantly I would be back there and all the emotions at the time would come flooding in on me. I might have a panic attack um, related to that. But I would say triggers and dreams and panic attacks were the main things. Did you ever have any <laughs> insomnia? Oh, yeah. I mean, I still take a sleeping sleeping help, yeah. Tell me about how your kids are today. Well, my oldest daughter is pretty good. She's in a really nice marriage relationship. She has two beautiful little girls. Um, and I would say, from all accounts, they have a good marriage. Um, she's very focused on not letting what happened with us happened with her. Um, she's very conscious about how they, how she and her husband relate to one another to not yell and those type of things. And she's very good with boundaries. Um, she actually took some psychology and she actually got a degree in psychology. So she has had some assistance there, I think on how to, you know, set her life up so that it doesn't repeat what she was raised in. Um, and she draws the line with her father. She has texted back and forth with him some, but he's constantly wanting to see her, wanting to see the kids. And um, he won't go by the boundaries that she draws. And so she just tells him, you know, if you're not going to abide by these boundaries, you know, then I'm, I can't see you. You know, you have to abide by these boundaries. You're not going to, you know, run over me. Mm. So they don't see each other Um, and my middle daughter um she has she got into an abusive marriage that ended um and she has two little twins from that i have had a lot of guilt about staying in that marriage 40 years with them um i thought at the time that was the thing to do because you know everybody said that you know children of divorce don't do well and i just thought they were better off in a married family. And of course, I was also deny, in denial and shoving things under the rug, too. So I wasn't totally dealing with reality. But um, I've had a lot of guilt about that. And I have gone to my kids more than once and just told them, you know, I'm very sorry that I kept you in that situation. And, you know, yes, there were reasons. Um, and they were valid reasons. But, you know, that's not an excuse. And I do apologize for that. Um, I felt like it was necessary to tell them, you know, that I'm sorry for that. I'm sure they really appreciated it. You know, I, I think that kids in general, and this is a generalization, do want to forgive their parents. And if their parents are humble enough to come to them and say, well, I really, if I could have replayed that, I would have done that differently. And I'm sorry about that. I think that kids are pretty forgiving. So some people have pastors who will say something like, if you walk away from your marriage, you're walking away from Jesus. And I think it would really surprise them to see how how committed a Christians so many of us are. Now, obviously, some were so injured and so betrayed by their pastor and by their church. Who can blame them for not ever wanting to darken the door of a church again? But tell us a little bit about how you look at your faith today in comparison to when you were married. 
the influences, your beliefs and things like that? So church was a huge influence on me. And um, I read my Bible all the time. I memorized scripture. I went to Bible studies. Um, and that's a big reason why I stayed for 40 years. Um, I just kept praying for God to change his heart. I kept believing that God was going to do it. I kept thinking if I pray harder, if I try harder, if I'm more respectful, you know, um, this will turn around. And I remember, you know, I got very obsessed with John Piper. I probably listened to over 300 of his sermons online. I just thought he was wonderful. And then we actually changed denominations um, shortly before I, you know, got really into his teachings. Um, and during that time, I became familiar with his teachings on marriage. And to me, it was just revolutionary that it was a picture of our relationship with Christ. And, you know, that um, even a bad marriage could be a picture of that, you know, um, and that we are never to give up on our marriage. And even in cases of abuse, it might be OK to separate for a while if you're being physically abused. But um, you should even be willing to withstand some of that. But if it gets really, really bad and you think you might be killed, I guess it's OK to separate for a little while. Um, and, you know, that played a very big part towards the end of me staying. I remember one day I was driving on a road. I know exactly where it was. And I was thinking about, because I had gotten where I thought about divorce all the time. I daydreamed about divorcing him and what my life would be like without him. And I just really wanted to be divorced and away from him. But I remember thinking about all of that and, and thinking about John Piper's teachings and how, you know, you're in it. And that's just the way it is. And that's what I said to myself. I said to myself, you know, Shari, you just are going to have to um, settle down. And this is your life. You're not going to get out of this. You're going to just keep hanging in there and hoping and believing. And that's the end. It doesn't matter how miserable you may be. You just accept it and go forward. I remember very distinctly having that thought. Um, and so that kind of teaching and then all of the counselors who wouldn't call it what it was and just kept encouraging, you know, pray harder, believe harder, do this, do that. You know, I was always focused on me, even though he was the one that was raging and cheating and doing all the things he was, it was focused on me. They were pressuring you. Yes. They were trying to get you to to try, stay in there, hang in there, try new tactics. Right. Because yeah. you were more compliant. <laughs> and just that constant message, you know, of stay, 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 and God will win the day. But eventually I realized with a lot of help, that um, you have to have two people who want to change. Just having one person who wants to change is not going to do it. And, um, you know, I don't think God, you know, wants us to live in that kind of misery. Um, I still believe in the Lord very much in Jesus Christ. I love him very much, and I have a personal relationship with him. I um, still, you know, read my word and listen to worship music. And sometimes I'll listen to sermons on Sunday morning. But, you know, all of the um, things that have been going on in the church with the patriarchy and, you know, the complementarian marriage stuff and the sexual abuse in all the churches, all of these things. And what I've been through myself, including um a very long-term pastor friend who took my husband's side and basically made fun of me mm. and just, you know, really gave me a hard time about leaving Ryan and didn't want to, he just kept saying, well, now, you know, there's two sides to everything and you just need to come back to church and, you know, just minimizing everything. Um, so all of that experience and what's going on in the churches today has made me, well, I don't trust them very much. And now, I'm, for people who don't know what you're talking about, tell us what complementarianism is, and then we'll jump into, then tell us about what patriarchy is. You know, basically, it's the teachings in Ephesians about the woman is to submit to the husband and 
how, you know, they'll give you the picture of God's big umbrella and the man is under that and the woman's under that and the children are under that, you know, and God, uh, the man is supposed to lead you to Christ and be over you. And, um, you know, Piper very much teaches that too, that the man is supposed to lead you to Christ. Um, so I believe in submission, but I believe in a mutual submission. And, um, I do not believe I need anybody to be an intermediary except Jesus Christ between Amen. me and God. No, I don't need my husband to lead me to God or to be my intermediary. And when I die, he's not going to be the one on the hot seat. <laughs> it will be me. It'll be what, you know, my life. Well, it'll be the righteousness of Christ, but um, you know what I mean. So I really don't like all of that kind of teaching and, you know, the way they keep women boxed in so much and they just can't stomach it anymore. And yeah. Sure that has somewhat to do with what I've been through. I'm sure it does. Anyway, if you go to a counselor who's connected to a church and if that church is a permanence view church where they don't allow divorce at all, if it doesn't fit their theology of divorce, going to one of their counselors isn't going to help because they have no answers and they're afraid that if they identify it, you're going to have to do something about it. So they just choose not to identify it. And Which they is how I handled it. <laughs> I knew if I, if I identified it for what it really was, I'd have to call the police or I'd have to file for divorce because it was too awful. Let's go to another topic. I'm going to, I'm just going to throw this out here and you can do with what you want to with it. So I want to ask you about sex, dating, and singleness. Well, I mean, not everybody would want to get remarried. Um, I do want to marry again someday, hopefully. Um, but, you know, I certainly have my radar, and my antenna up, you know, looking to be sure. Um, I've been dating this particular man almost two and a half years. I met him online and um, we hit it off right away. And so we've been dating almost two and a half years. But, you know, we are probably headed in that direction, but we're not ready to pull the trigger yet. So um, I think, you know, that you need to take time to heal. And I went through intensive, intensive therapy in between. So I do think that you need to give yourself some time to um, just kind of decompress from all of that, um, you know, try to get your head on straight and um, figure out who you are apart from that person and get to a healthy place, you know, before you start dating. Um, that would be my thought. And then when you start dating, to not be in a hurry. It takes time to know somebody, to really know them, you know, and people who want to get married in six months or nine months or even a year, you know, that to me is just way too fast. Well, now a lot of women will say, I don't know that I could ever trust again. How do you deal with the issue of trusting yourself to see the red flags in case they're there? Well, that is, you know, a worry. I think for most women who've been through this um, and I think reading books like that one by Lundy Bancroft that I mentioned earlier and just knowing what an abusive man looks like um, and recognizing, you know, what the red flags are. So that if you see them, but then even if you see them, you have to be able to act on that and cut that relationship off, which, you know, that's not always easy to do that. Um, so, just lots of caution and um, trying to educate yourself on what to look for in a potential spouse and taking lots of time. You know, boundaries are very important. And I think one thing since I've been through all this is I've learned to put up some boundaries around my own life and to be less concerned. You know, I'm always a people pleaser and I'm learning, you know, to not be that way um, and to put up some loving boundaries and um, those things are all important to do and to learn how to do. But Yeah, absolutely. It, it does take time. And having a good partner who's understanding, who, who's, who truly cares about your well-being, uh, who 
has your best interests at heart makes all the difference in the world. Yes. And it's, you know, it, it was so different for me to have a man who um, really paid attention and was generous and kind. And, you know, constant, he constantly tells me how smart I am, how I'm the smartest person he knows and how capable I am and how he respects my opinions. And he's constantly telling me those things. And that helps too to have some positives. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. It could be anybody who's just telling you positive things. That helps too, to break down those, um, that idea that you have of yourself that was planted in you by your abuser. That That is absolutely beautiful. And I'm glad he's that way towards you and that that's so nurturing to your soul. <laughs> if you could tell men and women something to give them hope what would you want to say to them right now one day at a time just think about today you know one day at a time and we're gonna we're gonna get through this you're gonna make it and pray you know pray that god will help you because he will deliver i don't i never really thought about him helping me get divorced but that's exactly what he did mm-hmm.